guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer card game review and today's game up on the tabletop is called Of Knights and Ninjas by Blue Fox Games. Of Knights and Ninjas plays two to six players, takes about a half an hour to play and it's for ages 10 and up. And in the game you're basically trying to gather a collection of cards and those cards are going to represent your kingdom. They might be castles or princesses, kings, queens, uh, the knights, the peasants. You're going to have things like ninjas and dragons and archers. And then, of course, things like bards and merchants and ladders and catapults. There's a ton of different cards in the game, is what I'm basically saying, that you're going to be creating your castle. You'll draw a certain number of cards. You'll either do something like an attack action or a fortify action. There are certain cards that will respond to other players when they attack you, like the, elect uh, the executioner that can stop a player in their tracks, or something like a bard that can lull your opponents to sleep before hurting you and, of course, taking your spoils. And spoils is the most important part of the game because every player is going to start off with a certain number of spoils or treasures. Those treasures you want to keep near and dear to you because other kingdoms are looking to gather those treasures as well. If a certain amount of treasures has been gained by one of your opponents in a three or more player game, that being 10, and in a two player game, that being all of them, then that specific player is going to win. But players are going to try and stop that from happening by using their response cards and defense cards as best as they possibly can. Regardless though, if you can amass a powerful kingdom and use that kingdom's offensive abilities to destroy your opponent's defenses and gain their treasure, you will win the game of knights and ninjas. Let's go and take a look down below. I'll show you what comes in the game. I'll show you how to play and we'll talk about it. Welcome to the kingdom. And uh, this is the kingdom full of cards that you can potentially gain when you're playing the game of knights and ninjas. Ninjas. We're going to go ahead and discuss all the cards very quickly, but to give you a good sense of what they do, and and then we're going to go ahead and to explain the two-player game and then the three to six-player game because they definitely are actually pretty different from each other. So let's begin. This is the entire stack of cards you'll be getting along with all of these. Inside this deck is just a mixture of all of these unique cards, and as you, there's quite a bit of different cards you can add to your kingdom as you're playing this game. There are the four basic cards. These ones here have attack values of one, two, three, and four the peasant, the soldier, the knight, and the king. They don't have any special abilities, they just do damage, and their damage is based on the number in the top right hand corner. There's also three special cards that can be played outside of a turn. These are basically a one shot when you use them, that is the only thing you can do on your turn. The merchant, the monk, and the herald. The merchant is going to allow you to basically give players coins and then take cards from their hand and put them into your hand. The monk is a card that you can play on people that are are fortified and they will have to give you a tax. The Herald is a card you can play that will allow everybody to take a card from their hand, reveal it face up on the table, and let you choose one of those cards to take up into your hand. Then we have the more interesting attack cards and respawn cards, the execution of the dragon, the highwayman, and the ninja. The dragon is able to destroy castles and it additionally deals two damage. The Executioner is able to respond to a card that attacks, such as one of these guys here, and stops the attack from happening and ends that player's turn. The Highwayman's pretty cool as well. If a player attacks you with something like a 3, and you defend it with a 1, then you can play the Highwayman to stop the player who dealt damage to you from stealing your gems. There's the Ninja, which is able to defeat archers, and also um, is able to uh, attack other ninjas, of course. And then you're going to have the Ladder and the Jester. The Jester counts as pretty much any card in the game. You can just simply play it and say, this is a princess. The Ladder is able to climb up castles. You can play a ladder on your turn and in addition to the ladder you can play one of your attack cards which will allow you to attack through a castle. Castles are your fortifications next to archers. If you have a castle in play nothing can go through you unless it is a dragon or you're playing a ladder or you use a catapult to destroy the castle. Archers are also fortifications, but the only thing to get past archers are ninjas and other archers. When you play a ninja or another archer, that will remove this archer from the opponent from play. And like I said, catapults will destroy castles and or destroy archers in combination, but it will not destroy archers by themselves. The last three cards is the Minstrel, the Traitor, and the Princess. The Princess is a nice response because when you play a knight card on somebody and they use the Princess, they will take the knight card up into their hand. The same goes for the Dragon. 
the traitor is basically like a Yu-Gi-Oh mirror force. If you play something like a king and attack a player, you can then resp that player can then respond with a traitor, making the king in fact redirect their attack towards that player. Which of course can be countered with another traitor, making the king go back. So you could do the king as a double agent or even a triple agent if there is enough trader cards out there in players' hands. And finally, the Minstrel. The Minstrel can be played as a fortify action along with archers and castles, which will stop players from being able to attack you up until your next turn. It can also be played as a response card, which can basically stop players in their tracks from attacking you and protect you up until your next turn as well, which is probably the best way in order to use the Minstrel. Then there are the six different colors of the treasures you'll get in the game, enough for each player. So each player will start with this number of treasures, unless you're playing a two-player game. But regardless, that's pretty much what you get in the game. I'm going to shuffle all these up. We'll do a fast-forwarding kind of thing here, and then I'll show you how to play a two-player game and then a three- to six-player game. Let's go. Okay, the deck's shuffled, and we're going to show you a two-player game first, which is pretty simple. If you're playing two players, give somebody five and five, and then plus one each, so that being, being six treasures for each player. And then this game actually has a sort of drafting aspect to it, in which you're going to go ahead and take the top 15 cards, put them down just like this, set this deck aside, and then players are going to draft. And the way this draft works is pretty simple. Let's say this player starts the draft, he'll draw a card, and then he'll choose to keep this card into his or her play area, or he will pass it to his opponent and draw a new card. Now, this is a knight, so it's pretty good, so he'll keep this card. And then it's going to go to this player here. That player will look at this card, choose to keep it or pass it, and then pass the deck. Draw this card. Maybe he doesn't want this one, so he'll get this one instead. This player will do the same. Look at this card, choose to keep it or pass it. And then eventually all of the cards are going to get dealt out into players' hands. The player who drew the last card is the person who will start, and then they're going to have their hand of cards to begin the game. So when you're playing the game of Knights and Ninjas, you're going to simply play an attack card, or you're gonna go ahead and play a fortification card like this one here. If you play a fortify card or fortify cards, you'll end your turn. You can only play one archer and a castle. You can't play more than one of each of them, but you can play both of them, as well as I believe the minstrel as well, or the one that prevents you from being attacked. So if I want, I can go ahead and play that archer out, in which case we go to this player's turn, and this player can go ahead and respond by doing something that's similar, like the castle there. And then after that, we pass and we go to this player's turn here. Now, this player can't attack this player because it has a ca he, he or she has a castle. And the only thing they can get over castles are things like I talked about before, like the catapult. The catapult can destroy that, which will put these two into the discard pile. And then this player can keep playing attack cards. You can continue to attack on your turn provided you don't gain any resources. But the moment resources exchange hands, that will end the attacker's turn. If you can't fortify or attack, you're basically going to discard a card from your hand. But if you have less than four cards in your hand, you can actually t choose to rest, which will basically let players take this deck, draw 15 cards, and repeat the process of gaining cards by doing the draft, which will continue the game. But let's go ahead and show you a quick uh, field of attacks. So I went and did my catapult attack, destroyed the castle. I'll play a knight out, which is going to do three damage to this player. And this player has an executioner as a special response that will just simply destroy the knight and end this player's turn, passing it on to this player over here. And this player will simply play a peasant. What's interesting about peasants though, is you can play more than one. Normally you can only play one attack card at a time, but with peasants, you can revolt with them and attack with multiple peasants. So this player will attack with two peasants. And then this player here, can respond with two peasants as well if he or she chooses to do so, protecting them from being attacked. This player can keep going if they want, so maybe they'll play a knight, in which case this player only has a peasant, a wild card, and a monk. Maybe they want to save that wild card though, so they'll go ahead and play one peasant. When they do that, the three will go to the one, thusly doing two damage to this player here, and this player will have to give up two tokens or two treasures over to this player here, in which case that is going to end this player's turn because an attack was successful and now it's this player's turn this player can choose to make a special action or play a fortify or an attack using this wild card or they can simply go on to the next draft which would basically draw out these 15 cards here and the player is going to then look at one choose to pass and continue playing the game just like that and in a two-player game once one person acquires all of the treasures of another player the game is going to end and the player with all the treasures wins 
And that's pretty much it for the two player game. Now the difference between the two player game and a multiple three to six player game is pretty simple. All you're going to do is shuffle this deck up here and then for each player, they're going to get five treasure tokens or five treasure gems. So we'll go ahead and give five here purple, five blue, and then we'll play with red here for this player here. Take this deck, make sure it's nice and shuffled and then deal out two cards to each player. And the player who most recently visited a castle, or whatever criteria you want to have it be, will get to go first. The first player is only going to draw one card. Every other player at the beginning of their turn is going to draw two cards, however. And you're going to play the game just like you would the two-player game, but instead of ever doing a draft, you're just simply going to keep drawing two cards from this deck, and continuing until one player has ten of these treasures. Once one player acquires 10 treasures, they're going to win the game of Knights and Ninjas. And that's pretty much the idea of the game. There's not much else to talk about as far as how the game works, other than, of course, there's a ton of card interactions, as well as some unique things that can happen on a player's turn, which we'll come up and talk about now. Defending your castle from the onslaught of tyranny that is against you is a tough and dangerous job, but someone has to do it. And in the game of Knights and Ninjas, you are the person that has been chosen to protect your kingdom and keep your treasures safe. Because as you know, no treasures in your kingdom means that nobody's going to want to follow you. So the more treasure you have, the more powerful your kingdom is going to be. And that theme comes through fairly well in this game. Now, of course, there is the one, the two player game and then the three or more player game, which function very similarly, but have different aspects to them. One has a really unique draft drafting aspect, and the other is a card drawing game in which you're drawing two cards and playing as many as you can, which becomes more of a social game. There is less social actions in the one, in the two player game. I keep saying one, but the two player game of this game. But in a three or more player game, there's a lot more social things like this player has this many gems and we can't let him get 10 because if we do, we're in trouble. So if I have three gems and you have none and he has six or whatever, most likely I'm going to hit the person with six. However, what if they have a castle and I can't go ahead and hit them? I have to choose to hit this player here or they're hitting me just because they can't hit them. And I'm like, why are you hitting me? You have zero and he's got six and I only have three. Well, because I can only hit you and you shouldn't hit me back because otherwise he might win the game. It adds that social interaction to the game. There's a lot of cards that have a lot of different abilities. And my first suggestion for this game is to make sure you include, of course, a character reference card so that everyone knows what all of these do. Some of them are fairly intuitive, but of course, with this many different unique cards, it's going to be easier if there's player references for everybody to know exactly how the cards function, when you can use them, and how many you can use. Because there are cards like the Peasants, which are a basic normal one, but they have that unique Revolt ability, which can basically be placing more and more of them down to protect you against something as strong as maybe even a king. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that the Highwayman doesn't need to be used, and most of these response cards don't need to be used on your turn, which I did mention, I think. But what I didn't mention is you don't have to use it as an interaction that responds to yourself. So if somebody takes three gems from you, you can play the Highwayman and take those three gems back. What's more interesting with this character here is if I do four damage to Grant and he gives me four gems, you can play the Highwayman and take four gems that were coming to me and it'll go to you instead. The Traitor, which is basically a mirror force, the thing that, oh, you're hitting me for four, you're hitting yourself for four. And then they go, I've got a traitor, and now my my double agent is actually a triple agent, and he is now hitting you for four instead. And that is a unique aspect. Traitors are able to climb, or not traitors, ninjas are able to climb walls. They can climb the walls of fortresses, they can deal with those pesky archers, and they can attack directly through. But in general, castles are pretty tough to defeat, and a lot of times they'll stay and play for a bit, which is very good for you when you can get your... Uh, fortifying actions to keep archers and castles. You want to put as many different fortifications as possible. Having one of the uh, the minstrels and the archers and the castle in play will definitely prevent players from even bothering to mess with you, which can give you at least one or two turns to acquire more cards in the game. The original two-player game is going to be more of a game in which you're trying to play as much as you can, draw back up to as much as you can, choosing to utilize cards when you need to, and having more cards than your opponent to start panging them for a lot of damage to suck 
away all of their gems before they can go back to rectifying their hand to have multiple cards in it. And then in a three to six player game, it's going to be more based on controlling and keeping everything sustained inside and in front of you, as well as utilizing your social capabilities to prevent players from attacking you and giving them reason to attack this player over here. Whether it be things like, I've got these cards in my hand, or I have these things on my field, or this player has more gems than me and thusly you should hit them instead. And a lot of that has some interesting aspects to it. The Heralds, Merchants, and Monks provide some in in interesting, unique aspects to a game, which allow you to gain more cards or more gems from players depending on their board layout. It's a way to kind of balance the scales for you, but none of the cards in this game are overly powerful or completely like ridiculous. Yes, there are certain cards that can make you lose a turn per se, but the turns are so quick it's not even going to matter. The artwork for the game is great. I actually really, really like this artwork. It's very simplistic, but it gets the job done. It shows you exactly what all the characters are. They function very well, and they all have their own unique abilities that pertain to that specific character. I enjoyed this game when I played it two players, and then when I played the three or more player versions of the game with multiple players, it was a lot of fun as well, and it did have a different experience, but it does play really well as a two player experience as well, providing you don't mind a little bit of a draft and the fact that there's a lot less social interaction, but when a two player game gets played in general, you're just trying to dominate the other player and play the best strategy you possibly can. There is luck though, because sometimes you're just going to get the better cards, which is not so bad in a three or more player game, but when you present the draft in a two player game, it at least gives you the choice of keeping cards and then getting rid of them to fortify your hand as best as possible. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about this game. I really, really enjoyed my experience with this one. This one is a lot of fun for a basic card game. It doesn't feel necessarily like a take that game. It actually feels like a little bit of a tableau management. It has that gateway feel. It also has an interaction of some take that's or response cards, but not too much. So it's kind of right there in the middle for me. I enjoyed this a I, and greatly. I really did. Uh, the only thing I can say about this is obviously you're definitely going to need a key so all the players know what all the cards do, specifically players that are newer to games. There is a lot of unique cards, which is a bonus and of course potentially a negative if they cannot remember all of the cards in the game. The gems are exactly what you need and overall I really had a good time with of Knights and Ninjas. If you're interested in taking a look at the game, go ahead and hit the link down below in the description where you can pick it up on Kickstarter today. Thanks for watching, and as always, I look forward to seeing you guys in the castle or the kingdom next time. Ninja out.